thank you, Nanapur, for the opportunity to come speak here today. Um, I was actually going to make a joke about how the title should be, Is the Future of Clinical Genetic Testing, but Emma, Emma did it for me. So it, it, I do think long-range sequencing is the future, and what I hope to show you over the next 10 minutes or so is why. I'm gonna, I want you to take three points home today from my talk. And the first one is that long reads are gonna change clinical genetic testing over the next five years. And actually, I used this slide for the first time a year ago in San Diego at a talk where there were a lot of people who do short read sequencing, and I got a lot of laser eyes when I said this. So <laughs> within four years, this is gonna happen. Overall, this makes testing more equitable. More people have access to a precise genetic diagnosis. That's what long reads give us. And then finally, this happens even if the cost of generating other types of data falls to zero. You can give away arrays, you can give away short read sequencing, but on the germline clinical side, it makes more sense to use a more comprehensive test. Why is that? Well, the way we currently do clinical genetic testing uh, there's a lot of problems with it. It's a bit of a game. Now, this isn't really the diagnostic odyssey. This is part of the diagnostic odyssey. But the first thing is that this is an inefficient process. People have to go to clinics multiple times. They have to have multiple sample collections. They have to talk to multiple providers. During this process, they get referred to different specialists. They have to take time off work. They have to find babysitters for their other kids. They don't go to the genetics appointments because they cost money, right? So we need to simplify this process. It can't be a game like this anymore. And I hope the uh, shoots and ladders analogy works for everybody in the room. We do know that current testing is incomplete, right? So we know that short read-based methods, for example, capture less than half of the structural variants that are present in any one of our genomes. With long reads, we do see more than twice, twice as many uh, structural variants. Now, they are present in the short read data, but the trick is finding them. If you would like to write the 88th structural variant caller for short read data to see if you can increase this number, I encourage you to try, but I don't think you're gonna do it, right? We should just use long read sequencing. We also know that there are different types of variation which are only seen or easier to see with long read sequencing. Intronic variants, deletions of entire exons, uh, alu insertions, and then inversions as well. And then finally, the current methods we have are very expensive. They require labs to maintain multiple tests, train their uh, staff on each one of these tests, some of which they may use very rarely. You know, they have to work through these workflows. So on the left, I'm showing you for prader willi angelin syndrome, which I'll show you some data from in a little bit. Um, uh, and on the right, Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, where each one of those purple boxes is a new test. So there's certain decisions that you make along the way to get to those. So you have to maintain competency. You have to maintain, you have to validate those tests. That's expensive and time consuming. So why haven't we used long reads yet in the clinical setting? Well, one of the historical concerns has been the accuracy, of course. But to me, today, this, this concern is resolved. So at the top, I'm just showing you data from the R9 flow cell. Um, I'm showing you one of our favorite control genes, call 1A1, and this is about a 40 or 50,000 base pair region. If you don't look at a lot of IGV plots, what I'll tell you is that the top is very noisy, and the bottom is much cleaner. This is what I call Q27, maybe it's Q28, maybe it's Q25. I honestly don't care anymore. The bottom is nanopore data, and that's just what I'm going to call it from going forward. The point here is that it's cleaner. We can see most of the variation that we expect to see, and it's comparable with other technologies. So we're there from a price perspective. We're there from an uh, error rate perspective. So what does this lead to? What does this mean long-read sequencing will be for all of us? It's more efficient. You can do multiple types of testing using a single technology, so these families don't have to go through this process of getting referred back to other providers, getting new tests ordered, having new tests approved by insurance, things like that. Long read sequencing is more complete, of course. You get, we're gonna call variants from haplotype resolved assemblies, probably using things like pan-genome or graph callers. Um, we're gonna see more disease-causing variation. We're gonna see all the disease-causing variation. So on the bottom left, what I'm showing you is data from the 1,000 Genomes Project, where we're sequencing uh, 500 to 800 of the 1,000 genome samples with long reads, and we see that using different callers, we're able to capture what we think are most of the structural variants present in any genome, so about 25,000 or so from each. And on the right, what I'm showing you is from a case that we solved um, in collaboration with he Heather Mefford from, um, uh, from St. Jude, where a kiddo had a translocation between the X chromosome and chromosome 13 that caused epilepsy and unfortunately led to the child passing away. This translocation was missed by standard clinical testing, short read exome, at a clinical lab. It was also missed by research, uh, short read whole genome sequencing. So 
uh, getting this information from long reads is, is much more straightforward. And then finally, long read sequencing overall is gonna be more, is gonna be cheaper. It's gonna be more inexpensive for clinical labs. These workflows are gonna be simplified, they're efficient, and they're gonna reduce the overall cost of testing, of maintaining the test. So on the, uh, the top one where I show you the current workflow, if you imagine a situation where a kiddo has seizures, they come to a clinic, and maybe the provider suspects that they could have Angelman syndrome. So they, they order that testing, which is gonna involve things like copy number variant analysis, methylation testing, and then targeted sequencing of UBE3A. That takes time, those are different tests the lab has to do. If that's negative, they may go to another test, like a genome-wide copy number uh, uh, analysis, or if that's negative, they then go look for SNPs or indels in uh, a genome or an exome, and they finally get to the answer. The thing with long reads is, on the bottom, is that you get that answer just by analyzing the data in a stepwise fashion. You sequence it once, and you do all these analyses computationally. We've shown that at, uh, at University of Washington and Seattle Children's. So this is work that was led by Kate Paschal, who's a, um, a, a, the lab director for the molecular lab at Children's and who gave a great talk yesterday um, about uh, newborn screening using long reads. Uh, just really briefly, we did a study where we took 20 individuals who we knew had Prader-Willi or Angelman syndrome, and we did whole genome long read sequencing of those individuals. And we asked a simple question. Could we make a test, could we build a report that people who don't have expertise with long read sequencing could analyze? And the answer was yes. So what I'm showing you here on top is just a copy number plot. So it's just basically the, um, the average coverage across the proximal region of chromosome 15Q. And it shows you that for this individual, they have a deletion between what we say is breakpoint 2 and breakpoint 3, so BP2 and 3. This is noisy. This is R9 data. This gets a lot cleaner over those breakpoints when you go to R10 or Q25 or Q27 or whatever it is, for example. The nice thing about long reads is we get multiple pieces of information, of course, in a single test. So we can not only evaluate copy number, but also the SNPs as well. So we see that we lose heterozygosity over that region of the deletion. And then finally, we can look at methylation, of course, and we can compare it to controls. And we see that at the key CPG, it's in snrf snrpin we see a loss of methylation. So the red box is lower than the gray box. And that tells us that this is a case of, um, of Prader-Willi syndrome. We can also do things that we really could never do before with clinical testing. We can phase variants that are uh, uh, far away. So for Angelman syndrome, sometimes they're caused by de novo mutations or inherited mutations in UBE3A. Um, those need to be on the maternal haplotype. Uh, sometimes you can figure that out with parental testing, sometimes you can't. Sometimes parents aren't available for testing. This is one case we looked at where you can see on, the f on your right, in the bottom right, there's a three base pair deletion on haplotype two. It's pathogenic. And then on your left, what you see is that haplotype 2 is red, meaning it's methylated, meaning it's the maternal copy. So we're able to phase this in the absence of having the parental samples. So what do we all need to do to make this, to really realize the potential of long-range sequencing in the clinical setting? Well, the first thing we need is we need databases of control variants from diverse populations to allow us to filter and prioritize this data. It's really hard to look through 25,000 structural variants and find the one that's causative. Sometimes it's not hard, but most of the time it is actually challenging. This includes databases for methylation as well. So um, I will say that you know, part of this is being done by us with the 1,000 Genome Sequencing Consortium. At most, that'll be 3,000 or so samples. That's not enough. Um, there is work, of course, in the U.S. with the All of Us Project, and then the work that's being done here in the, U or in, the, in the U.K. by Genomics England, and then other consortiums worldwide. But we need to bring all that data together and make it accessible to the entire community. This allows us to identify things like small variants in genes that are difficult to sequence. Haydn is one of my favorite. I've seen a couple of clinical cases like that. Um, it's a difficult gene to sequence with short reads. It's not that difficult with long reads. Um, structural variants, so this is just a, a small snippet of uh, the distribution of uh, repeat links and certain and disease-associated uh, short tandem repeats. Uh, this is work actually that Sophie Gibson, who's here somewhere in the audience, did in my lab. Um, and then finally, of course, we can use long reads to, uh, to, to build methylation classifiers. And here I'm showing you a plot of three individuals with Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome and showing you that they cluster separately um, from uh, controls. And it's kind of a made up, well, it's a real plot, but the principal components are zero because, well, long story. We need automation for the clinical space. Um, if you were here the other day, you saw Clive's talk and he made fun of kind of the pipetting of the flow cells. If you've ever loaded a min ion, that hit very close to home, it hit close to home for me, but it's very true. 
The sample handling, the library prep, and the loading needs to be simplified for this to really take off in the clinical space. We need good tertiary analysis pipelines that use every piece of the long read data. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna be unpopular for saying this, but they cannot be built on existing exome analysis tools. They have to be built from the ground up. In the US, we need to engage the payers to figure out how do we pay for this. This is a different way of thinking about testing. You're not ordering a specific test for a certain indication. You're ordering a broad test that can cover many indications. That's a different way of thinking about testing. Um, I, I think that's gonna be easier in countries with single payer systems, but I don't know for sure. And then finally, one thing that's not talked about a lot is that we need resources for counseling and discussing these results. If you ever tried to return an IKBKG result for incontinenta pigmenti for a family, you understand that explaining things like methylation, in-segmental duplications is very difficult, right? So we need good resources to, to do this. So I'll end just by saying that I do think, I believe that long read sequencing is the future of clinical genetic testing. Um, you know, today we have the stepwise system. It takes many years to go through. In the future, this is gonna be comprehensive testing that's completed in hours, not days. And I do think that newborn screening will eventually be long read sequencing based. And then today, genetic testing sometimes drives our clinical decision making. And I think in the future, genetic testing will often drive our clinical decision making. So I'll stop there, and again, I'll say thank you for your attention. Thank you to Nanopore for the opportunity. And of course, thank you to my lab, who does all this amazing work um, and uh, is really the, you know, uh, the reason I get to come here and give great talks like this. So thank you all. <laughs>